Archaic Records. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Archaic Records here with you again. My name is Jamie, coming at you from Nashville, Tennessee. Here to wish you a very happy Morrissey Monday, a weekly celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths. And yes, I realize that I am once again a day late uh, with this week's episode, but what can I tell you, man? Things have been relatively hectic around here lately, and if you think that that sounds like a pretty flimsy excuse, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Sue me, man! Uh, Anyway, for this week's episode, we're going to go back to 1997, uh, October 8th of 1997 to be exact, and if you are willing to indulge me a little bit, uh, here we go again, I'd like to tell you the story of my first ever uh, Morrissey show, which I was in attendance for. It was on October 8th, 1997 on the Maladjusted Tour. At the Warfield Theater in San Francisco, uh, California. Now, of course, Morrissey was uh, touring in support of his sixth studio album in 1997, Maladjusted, a record which came out on August 11th of that year. And when Maladjusted first came out, it was a record uh, that I immediately liked. It's a record that I still like, I still listen to uh, in relatively you know, heavy rotation, but at the time, it was a record to me uh, that was very much different than anything else uh, in Morrissey's catalog up to that point in time. Now, I'm somebody who has testified in the past, and I stand by it, that I do believe that every Morrissey album is unique. I think each one is different. I think that the big guy never Uh, repeats himself but that being said 1997 when maladjusted came out i felt like this record was a real big departure uh, from any of its siblings in morrissey's catalog uh, up to that point in time i mean stylistically uh, this record was a lot different Uh, i think his songwriting on this record uh, was uh, you know unique from anything that i had heard him put out uh, in the past and even if you look at the record sort of superficially you know, with uh, the album art. I mean, even the album cover uh, of Maladjusted doesn't necessarily look like a traditional uh, Morrissey album cover. I remember when this record first was announced and the album artwork was released, I remember not being completely infatuated with the album art uh, the first time I saw it, especially the color scheme, the sort of, you know, the silver and green it just sort of didn't really do it for me. And I remember the photograph in particular being quite a conversation stimulator among me and some of my friends at the time. Now, one of my friends, when this record first came out, uh, was not a big Morrissey fan. In fact, I would make the argument that he was quite the opposite. Uh, Morrissey was often in his crosshairs when it came to his uh, sort of snarky sense of humor. But when this record first came out, and of course, I bought this record right when it came out, He thought that the album cover uh, was quite funny, I must say. He told me he looked like Morrissey was a guy uh, standing on a street corner waiting for a city bus, uh, trying not to crap his pants. Uh, He also asked me at the time, he said, do you think Morrissey is doing okay uh, financially? I mean, he looks a little bit homeless in that photograph. Uh, Now, over time, I've sort of accepted the album art on Maladjusted. It's definitely not my... You know, my favorite of the uh, Morrissey album sleeves. But like this record, I think it sort of fits this record and that it is entirely unique uh, to the Morrissey catalog. And like I said, when this record, uh, you know, first came out, it was a record that I liked immediately. Uh, And I still do. Like I said, I still listen to this record on relatively high rotation. Now, I think that this is a record looking at it today in 2024, or even perhaps when it first came out in 1997, I think that this is a record uh, that, you know, creates a lot of divisiveness within uh, the Morrissey fan community. I've talked to people who really uh, do not like this record. Uh, I've talked to people that think that this is one of the best records uh, he's ever done. Now, for me, this record is not, certainly not in, you know, anywhere near the top 10, but it is a record that I do go back and listen to 
uh, pretty frequently. I think it's got a lot of uh, songs on this record that I still, uh, you know, love. Uh, and it, like I said, you know, this is a this was the first tour I ever saw back in October of 1997. So for me, this record, uh, you know, is incredi- incredibly sentimental, uh, at least for that. And uh, you know, one th- another thing that struck me interesting about this album around the time when it first came out was if you go back, if you went back and you watched the uh, the video when it first came out on MTV uh, for this first single, Album Matters. I remember at the time thinking that Morrissey didn't even really look like himself uh, in that video. I remember that his hair uh, had changed a lot from the videos before. And the thing that struck me the most uh, was just how skinny Morrissey is uh, in the Alma Matters video. Now, I love the video. It's actually one of my you know, favorite videos in Morrissey's you know, videography as far as the actual song, as far as the actual video goes. But you go back and you watch, look at that video. Morrissey is just tiny. Now, he's never really been a husky guy, especially going back that far into his career. But he was almost like frighteningly thin uh, in the Alma Matters video. Uh, but like I said, this was a record. I bought it right when it came out. It was a record that, that I liked. I knew a lot of people at the time who didn't necessarily... Love this record. I feel like also in 1997, uh, the musical climate had kind of changed. I don't know that Morrissey was necessarily at, you know, the height of his uh, popularity in 1997. And of course, after this record came out, uh, you know, Maladjusted, the next studio record wouldn't come out uh, for seven years after that, which was uh, You Were the Quarry, which I always tell people is sort of like Morrissey's 68 comeback special. It brought him back into, you know, the consciousness of sort of, you know, the mass uh, public. It wasn't just diehard Morrissey fans that loved you or the quarry. And, you know, at the time, Maladjusted, I felt like, was a record uh, that was basically purchased and consumed by people who were, you know, I would say fairly diehard on the fan spectrum. But anyway... Uh, this record came out. I really liked it. Not long after the record came out, I saw that this tour uh, was announced. And I believe I've mentioned this in the past ad nauseum that my Morrissey fandom was spawned in the spring of 1994 uh, on a school field trip when one of my classmates loaned me a copy of Morrissey's album. My favorite album of all time, still, Bone and Drag. And... Here we are now in, you know, August of 1997 with the new album coming out. I still haven't seen Morrissey live up to this point in time. And I'm certain that I had had opportunities between spring of 1994 and fall of 1997 to see the big guy live. I'm sure there were opportunities that I missed for one reason or another. But when this tour was announced, I made a conscious decision that there's just no way I'm missing uh, the Maladjusted Tour, especially uh, playing at a place like the Warfield in San Francisco. Now, if you haven't been to the Warfield uh, in San Francisco, it is a lovely venue. Uh, It's probably my second favorite venue in San Francisco. My favorite venue Uh, in San Francisco is probably my favorite music venue of all time, which is the historic Fillmore. Uh, But the Warfield is right downtown. It's right on Market Street. You know, uh, it is right in the heart of the city. There's so much to do around the the Warfield, especially back in uh, the mid-1990s, because I remember there was a lot of uh, little, like, good record stores uh, not nearby or nearby. Uh, and I remember the first time I ever went to the Warfield was probably in, I want to say it was like 1995, but I remember my first show at the Warfield uh, was I went to go see Danzig at the Warfield. Now I'm sort of a casual Danzig fan. He's not necessarily my favorite. I was going through a phase at the time where I was really into Danzig. And the reason, the main reason why I went to go see Danzig was because I went with a friend of mine from school and she was a huge Danzig fan and I was a huge fan of hers if you know what I mean Uh, and I think I went to go see the show for one but two I thought that there might be some sparks that would fly 
on that road trip from my hometown of Chico, California, down to San Francisco and back. Didn't happen. It was okay. The show was good. It was cool to see Danzig live back in the mid-1990s. But I remember going to the Warfield the first time, and I had been to the Fillmore a couple times before that. And the Warfield is a lot different than the Fillmore, but it is a great venue. Like I said, it's right downtown, right on Market Street. And I remember when this show was announced that my friend and I, who... I was hanging out with a lot. We decided that we were going to go. Uh, he was a sort of casual Morrissey fan. I was definitely a bigger Morrissey fan than he was, but he was somebody uh, that I went to shows with all the time back in those days. He and I were you know, really snug for a few years, and we probably went to, I mean, honestly, we probably went to maybe almost 100 shows together uh, in three years. He and I were definitely, uh, you know, musical compadres, uh, so I remember specifically the day before these tickets went on sale, I was living in the Bay Area, uh, and he was living in Sacramento. Uh, and there was just no way we were going to miss getting tickets to see this maladjusted tour. So I remember the next morning, the you know tickets went on sale at probably like 10 a.m. or maybe noon. Uh, so I remember that night, I drove out to Sacramento, and I actually spent the night uh, at his house, which wasn't uncommon. We he We would hang out at his house we'd watch movies and just be nerds basically uh, but i remember we got up early the next morning and we drove down to uh, the nearest tower records uh, to his house and this is something that you know young people nowadays i just can't even relate to and i'm not saying this as if i'm the old guy on his uh, front porch in his rocking chair pretending that things were better in those days even though they were uh, and that is the the act of, like, waiting in line to buy concert tickets. Now, like I said, I think that the tickets went on sale at, like, 10 a.m. or noon or whatever uh, at the Tower Records by my friend's house. And so he and I got there around, like, 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning. And there was already a few people waiting in line. Now, you know, if you've ever been to the Warfield in San Francisco, you know that it's not exactly the biggest venue in the world and we were in Sacramento and the show was in San Francisco so there was probably maybe 20 or 25 people in the line you know by the time they uh, let us in but one thing like I said young people nowadays we don't and you know even older people like me you know we don't have to do anymore is wait in line uh, for concert tickets but my friend and I pulled up and there were people standing in line outside of the Tower Records uh, and you know, a few of the people were wearing Morrissey shirts, and they're like, oh, this this must be the right place. Uh, and, you know, the fun thing back in those days about, you know, waiting in line for concert tickets, especially when a big show was announced, they were, it was the day they were going on sale, uh, is, you know, sitting around and conversing and uh, sort of bonding with your fellow fans uh, instead of sitting around like we all do nowadays. And uh, even when we're waiting in line for an event, everybody, of course, has their face in their phones and I'm not saying that I'm any better because I'm not but back in those days it was fun you know you would go and you would get in line and you know you would talk to the people around you you would talk about the new album you would talk about other shows you've seen uh, and I remember specifically telling somebody that I was a Morrissey virgin at the time and they were all excited for me uh, they told me that they'd seen you know this was somebody who was probably at the time I thought was older but this was somebody who had seen Morrissey going all the way back to his days with the Smiths. And there was just something fun about, you know, going back and waiting in line for concert tickets. I was telling somebody this the other day. Another thing I used to love doing, and this was kind of a, a thing that I did at Tower Records several times, but when a new album uh, was getting ready to drop, they used to do the thing where they would open the store at midnight, the day the record was released, and you could go in and you could get a copy of an album, you know, basically the minute it was released. And that was such a fun thing, too. You know, you stand in line, you're waiting, you know, you're bonding with your fellow uh, fanatics. Uh, that's something that, you know, I do miss. I know sometimes, you know, I can tend to be somewhat of a sentimentalist uh, when it comes to stuff like that. But, you know, man, it was so much fun back in those days to do that. Uh, you know, it might sound now like a pain in the ass, but, man, it really wasn't. So anyway, my friend and I get in, we buy our, our tickets. Of course, the show is probably a month or two, probably a month and a half away. 
And I spend that time just so excited. I mean, like I said, this was my first time uh, seeing Morrissey. I had had opportunities in the past, which I'm sure I squandered. Uh, but again, this was a record I really liked. I was, you know, I was listening to this record, especially back then when it was brand new. I was pretty much listening to this record, uh, you know, every day. Uh, so eventually the show, the day of the show arrives, uh, October 8th, 1997. My friend comes down to the Bay Area uh, from Sacramento and we head into the city uh, pretty early and that was sort of our uh, luggage back in those days he and I would meet up early on the day of a show and we would hang out in the city that the show was at whether it was uh, San Francisco usually or Sacramento or maybe out in Oakland we went to a couple shows out there uh, as well but you know we'd go get food and we would hit all up our comic book stores and record stores and all the stuff that we like to do and we get into the city pretty early i'm pretty sure we ate because my friend at the time was obsessed with food ironically the guy weighed like 60 pounds uh, but he could eat more food than anybody i've ever met and if he didn't eat you know pretty regularly he got insane like you know you talk about people you've known people who get hangry i mean this guy got hycotic uh, when his blood sugar dropped, which is understandable. Like I said, the guy weighed like seven pounds. Uh, so anyway, we are kicking around San Francisco. There was a bunch of cool stuff to do uh, right around the Warfield, right where the Warfield is on Market Street. still is. I mean, don't believe all the hype uh, people try to sell you on San Francisco now about, you know, what a war zone it is. Yeah, San Francisco is a little bit scuzzy right now. But I would still highly recommend you go visit San Francisco, especially if you get a chance to go to the uh, the Fillmore or the Warfield. Uh, so anyway, we get down there, we're doing our rounds, and eventually we end up on Columbus Avenue, uh, not not too far from where all of this activity is. Up on Columbus Avenue is where the huge Tower Records uh, in San Francisco used to be, and at the risk of sounding unfashionable. I was always a huge Tower Records fan. Uh, now, of course, uh, at this point in my life, I'm 21 years old. I'm not making the most uh, money in the world. Uh, so, of course, I loved going to CD stores where you could just stock up on a whole bunch of used CDs uh, all at once. But I always loved uh, Tower. I always felt like they had the best selection. I loved thumbing through the magazines. I loved that they sold imports. Uh, so my friend and I were up on the big, uh, big at the big Tower Records on Columbus, which was just one of the best Tower Records I, I'd ever been to. Uh, I mean, the best Tower Records I ever went to was actually the one in Seattle, uh, the one that was right across the street from the Space Needle. That was the best Tower Records that I ever went into. Uh, so anyway, my friend and I are in there kicking around, and you know it's getting to be like afternoon. Uh, and this is probably our last stop before we head downtown to go back down to where the Warfield is. And uh, we're kind of thumbing through some CDs, and we hear these two guys near us start talking, and uh, we can't help but overhear uh, one of them say that they had gone and seen Morrissey the night before at the Warfield. And as soon as I heard him say that, my stomach just dropped right out of my body. Uh, and I remember, of course, you have paper tickets back in those days. And the first thing I do is I pull my ticket out of my pocket and I look at the date and I make sure that the date's right. And it said October 8th. And I was like, he played last night? I went and told my, asked my friend, I was like, did he play last night? Did we miss the show? And uh, my friend was like, I don't think so. I mean, it's October 8th. The ticket says October 8th, unless there's some you know mix up or something. Uh, so basically he and I have what turns into like a mild, uh, like a mild panic attack. And we both basically make our purchases at the tower and we book it downtown because we are pretty much convinced at this point in time that we missed the show the day before. Uh, so anyway, we get downtown, back down to the Warfield, and, uh, you know, there are people beginning to gather out front. And, uh, you know, I look up at the marquee and Morrissey's name is on the marquee. And I was like, okay. And as I approach uh, the marquee, I realize that it, Morrissey, it says Morrissey, October 7th and 8th. And at the time, I didn't realize that Morrissey was playing uh, two nights at the Warfield. So uh, 
I had sort of two feelings at that moment. I had a, a feeling of relief because I realized that we hadn't missed uh, the shows that we had tickets for, but I also felt a little bit disappointed. I was like, man, if I knew he was playing both nights, uh, I may have just, you know, ponied up the ducats uh, to go to both shows. Uh, you know, on the bright side, though, we got downtown early, and like I said before, talking about waiting in line, uh, you know, to buy tickets, it was the same thing. Uh, back in those days, as you waited to get into the venue, you didn't have a smartphone, uh, you know, stapled to your hand to keep you distracted. So it was just common that you would end up sort of, you know, talking to the people around you, sort of geeking out, uh, if you will, being mutually excited, being part of a community, imagine that. Uh, and the other, you know, one of the good things about getting downtown so early was we were really, you know, pretty far up in the line. We got, when we got in, we got, you know, relatively close to the stage, probably the closest I've ever actually been uh, to Morrissey at any of the shows I've been to. I would say that it was either this one or uh, the Maladjusted show, or no, the, uh, You Are the Quarry show I saw in Chicago are probably the two closest I've ever been uh, to Morrissey, but my friend and I got in early. Uh, like I said, I'd been to the Warfield before. I sort of knew the layout. Uh, you know, the, the Warfield has sort of a floor area right in front of the stage, sort of a standing area. And then behind that, there's sort of a seated area, and then there's a big balcony. Uh, but my friend and I were, you know, right on the floor, relatively close. We were pretty close to the stage, but we were kind of off on the off on the right side, you know, like stage left, I guess you would call it. Uh, and at this point in time, I'm just buzzing with excitement. Like I said, I... Just about had a minor heart attack when I thought that Morrissey had played already the night before. Uh, and at this point in time, you know, I'm just starting to wonder through my head what songs he's going to play. You know, back in those days, it wasn't so much like today where you can, you know, you can, you know, go on and check set list from the tour you're about to see. I mean, that was one of the fun things for me going to shows back in this era, especially if it was a band or an artist that I was really into was just being curious about uh, you know the set list and you know what he's going to play and what he's going to wear and uh, especially with Morrissey because even though I was a virgin at this point in time Morrissey virgin not too far removed from being a real virgin also <laughs> uh, you know I had been warned by people in the past you know you gotta you gotta you know be prepared sometimes he isn't necessarily in the best mood when you see him but uh, yeah, that was the fun part, was the anticipation building up to it. Uh, and eventually, uh, you know, the lights came down, uh, and Morrissey came out, and the first, I remember the first time I saw him uh, in person, I was just completely, you know, starstruck as much as I've been with any other artist I've ever seen. I remember distinctly he came out, he kind of gave, like, his little, like, nod, and uh, immediately they went into... Uh, a song called Boy Racer. Now, before I get into too much of the set list, one thing I'd like to mention is uh, I recently discovered this show on YouTube. Now, I would love to, at some point in time, have a physical copy of this show, of some sort of a bootleg. Uh, now, I did find a really crappy recording of this show on YouTube uh, not too long ago, and I have listened to it a few times just basically, uh, you know, out of nostalgia, wanting to go back and at least hear the, you know, at least try to hear as, we as well as he performed during the show, which at the time, in 1997, this was my first show, I thought it was like, great, so it didn't really matter. Uh, but now that I've got, you know, a dozen Morrissey shows uh, under my belt, uh, some people might suggest that's all I have under my belt. <laughs> uh, it's fun to sort of, you know, go back and compare uh, different shows and different set lists. And the show that I went to on October 8th, 1997, uh, like I said, the recording it is on YouTube is really scuzzy. I mean, it almost sounds like if you go down to your garage and you pick up, you know, you grab a piece of sandpaper you have laying around, uh, you know, you come back upstairs, uh, you put on the concert video or the concert audio very quietly, and as you're trying to listen to it, you take the sandpaper and keep scraping it across your teeth. Uh, that's what this uh, recording sounds like. So it's not necessarily the best quality, but I'd love to get my hands on a, you know, a reasonably high quality 
a recording of this first show just for my own personal archive. Uh, anyway, the band comes out and they go into a, uh, as much as you can tell by listening to the recording, a pretty good version of the song Boy Racer uh, off of Southpaw Grammar. Um, a song I really do like, probably one of my favorite songs you know, off of Southpaw Grammar, if not my favorite song uh, off Southpaw Grammar. Uh, good version of it. After the after they play the song, Morrissey greets the crowd. Uh, they go into, after that, they go into a song off of uh, Maladjusted called Satan Has Rejected My Soul. Uh, and it's funny, this is Satan Rejected My Soul, not Satan Has Rejected My Soul, Satan Rejected My Soul. And this is a song I really like off of uh, Maladjusted. Of course, this is a song that I'm sure Morrissey retired not long after uh, this tour. I mean, the only thing Morrissey ever plays uh, off Maladjusted now is uh, Alma Matters. Uh, but this is a good version of it. I really love, I really do like the song Satan Rejected My Soul. I mean, subject matter wise, I feel like this definitely has, uh, you know, Morrissey's sense of humor uh, written all over it. After that, the band played uh, Billy Budd off of Vox Hall and I. Uh, Billy Budd is a song that I do like. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily one of my, you know, favorite songs off, you know, Vox Hall and I. I mean, Vox Hall and I is just like a classic album. So I don't think there's anything bad off Vox Hall and I at all. I do like the song Billy Bud is like I said as well as you can tell on this sort of really shabby bootleg uh, recording it is a good version of the song uh, I remember at the time when I saw this tour I was very excited uh, to hear the song Billy Bud because Vauxhall and I is one of my favorite records uh, of all time uh, and you know Boy Racer even though I like the song Boy Racer a lot you know, Southpaw Grammar is easily my least favorite uh, Morrissey record at the time. And when, you know, when Southpaw Grammar came out in 1995, that is a sentimental record for me in the sense that it was the first record that I bought as a new release as a Morrissey fan. And for the first year or two, year and a half or so, that record was out. I listened to it a lot. I really liked it. But I would say by 1997, that record had begun to sort of lose favor is the right way to put it. Uh, but that was a record that I was starting to listen to uh, a lot less. Uh, after that, he plays Alma Matters. Of course, it was the current single at the time. Uh, I remember this song got a huge response, probably because it was the current MTV and radio song. A great version of it uh, at this show at the Warfield. Like I said, this is the only song off uh, Maladjusted that, you know, Morrissey uh, still plays live. I just saw him down here twice in October. He played it both in Memphis and Nashville. Uh, if I had one, you know, request about this song now, and I'm not saying that you should retire Alma Matters, although if you know, I didn't see it again live, uh, it would be okay. But if he could trade this song out, uh, you know, for another song off, uh, Maladjusted, I mean, to me, my favorite song off Maladjusted is Ammunition. And I think it pretty much always has been. Uh, and Ammunition is a song I know I've never seen live. So, you know, I like seeing Alma Matters. I like the fact that he still represents Maladjusted when you see him live. But, you know, it's just sort of... At this point in time, it's not necessarily a song that really gets me excited. Now, at the time, it was a new song in 1997. I went nuts when I heard Alma Matters because uh, it was probably one of my favorite songs at the time. Uh, after that, he went into Dagenham Dave off of Southpaw Grammar. Dagenham Dave is a song, and on this recording it sounds good, it sounds just like the the album, but to me, Dagenham Dave is a song, it kind of is, it's kind of what I don't like about Southpaw Grammar as a record. I feel like Dagenham Dave is a song that's kind of like half finished. Uh, and I don't really, the thing I don't like about the song Dagenham Dave is it's basically just the chorus over and over and over again. And I felt like, and I talked about this when I 
talked about Southpaw Grammar, you know, as a record, is I feel like that record is so much, like, filler. I feel like so much of that record is deliberately sort of stretched to make a record out of, you know, maybe stuff that was a little bit incomplete. You know, I, I made the analogy when I talked about the record that when I was a kid, you know, my mom would always make Kool-Aid. Uh, and because we were white trash, and that's what you do. Uh, but, you know, as, you know, the pitcher of Kool-Aid became about half full, she would say this thing, and it always stuck with me, and she'd say, stretch the Kool-Aid. Which meant when it got to be half full, you fill it with water. No more flavor or sugar, you just fill it with water. So you ended up with this sort of weirdly flavored, you know, green water or whatever. And to me, Southpaw Grammar is Morrissey sort of stretching the Kool-Aid. I mean, you've got the two bookend songs on that record that are over 10 minutes long, sort of unnecessarily. Uh, and Dagenham Dave is a song that, to me, it's just like the chorus over and over and over again. Now, musically, I like the song Dagenham Dave. Somebody one time, I think it was on my Southpaw Grammar episode, Somebody left a comment saying they thought Dangnam Dave was like Morrissey's best song. I totally can't relate to that opinion at all. Uh, I mean, this performance of it is really good. If you like the song, and I don't dislike the song. Like I, I've said before about Southpaw Grammar, I don't dislike it. It's just pretty disappointing. I don't think it's up to Morrissey's standard, lyrically or musically or production wise or his vocals on that record it's just to me it's not great uh, after that Morsi plays who man one of my favorite songs of all time off of my early burglary years uh, sunny uh, and this is a song that i never get tired of uh, any opportunity i've ever had to see it live uh, it definitely is one that puckers my butthole uh, and this performance of it, uh, if you go back and watch this sort of scratchy uh, video on uh, YouTube, his performance uh, of this song is awesome. Uh, my early burglary years, to me, is, you know, it's such a great compilation. It's a little bit disjointed because it's got a couple of live tracks mixed into it, but uh, Sunny is a song that just, man, I never get tired of that song. Uh, every time that song starts, I think to myself, man, I love this fucking song. Uh, after that uh, is another song off my early burglary years, which is Nobody Loves Us. Uh, I've always said this about this song because I love this song. And for some reason, and it's never been explained to me, Steve, but for some reason this song doesn't make the final cut off of Southpaw Grammar, and I will never understand why, for one, one reason, because Southpaw Grammar only has like eight songs on it, so there's definitely room for another song on Southpaw Grammar, and two, because if this song makes Southpaw Grammar, it's instantly the best song on the entire record. This is better than anything that is actually on Southpaw Grammar, so I've never found a satisfactory answer as to why this song is not on Southpaw Grammar and this version of it is great. Both of these songs, Sunny and Nobody Loves Us on this show, are great. This is probably the high point of the show, especially going back and listening to it now because I I love both these songs. Now when I was in pre uh, you know, when I was present in the master at the master's feet, if you will, the whole show I thought was pretty great at the time uh, after that uh, is a song that I really don't really like uh, that much or no sorry this is a song I do like uh, reader meet author uh, sorry I was thinking of a different song reader meet author I love this song this is actually another one of my favorite songs I was thinking of teachers are afraid of the pupils uh, but no reader meet author I love this is one of my favorite songs uh, off of Southpaw grammar uh, my favorite song on South Park Grammar, or South Park Grammar, favorite song that made the album is Boy Racer. Uh, but I, I do really like the song uh, Reader Meet Author. Uh, this is a song on this tape. If you go back and find it on YouTube, 
uh, he performed it very well. Uh, after that, uh, he goes into Hold On To Your Friends from Vox Hall and I. This version of this song, uh, if you go back and watch this video off YouTube, it's great. Uh, very true to the original. This is one of my favorite songs uh, of Vox Hall and I. After that, he goes into another one of my favorite songs of Vox Hall and I. Now, my favorite song on Vox Hall and I is coming up in just a minute. Uh, but that is Now My Heart Is Full. So I would say that in this show, he played my three favorite songs uh, of Vox Hall and I, uh, because after this, he goes into Paint a Vulgar Picture off of Strange Ways, uh, Here We Come. Now, at this point in time, I do remember at the show that uh, he had not played any Smith songs up to this point in time. Uh, this was something I didn't know if that was normal. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if he, for some reason, didn't play Smith songs anymore, but he plays a really good version uh, of Paint a Vulgar Picture, and then he goes into Speedway, which is my favorite song uh, off Fox Hall and I. So the one, one good thing about this uh, set list is that he does do my three favorite songs off Fox Hall and I, just Speedway, which is not only one of my, fa my favorite songs on Fox Hall and I, it's one of my all-time favorite songs in the live set. Every time I go see Morrissey, uh, this is a song that I absolutely uh, just you know pray that he plays. And at this point in time, I'm a little bit surprised uh, because Morrissey basically says his goodnights and the stage goes dark. Now, if you're counting at home, we're 12 songs in. Not a very long set. And... If you're keeping track, which you're probably not, he hasn't, at, at, at least at this point in time, he hasn't played anything off Viva Hate. He hasn't played anything off Kill Uncle, Bona Drag, or Your Arsenal. And I remember standing there like, that it? Really? That it? I mean, I know he's going to come out and do at least one song as an encore, uh, which he did, which was Shoplifters of the World. Another song I love. First time I ever got to see it live. No complaints there, Steve. Uh, but I do remember he f played Shoplifters of the World, came out, played it well, and left. And that was it. show was over. House Lights came up. And, you know, like I said at the time, this was my first ever Morrissey show. I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. I had a good time. But I do remember my friend and I were leaving the show and thinking, like, man, that was pretty quick I don't know uh, what he's in a big hurt what he's in such a big hurry for uh, and like I said you know nothing off Viva hate nothing off kill uncle uh, nothing off bone and drag or your arsenal and at the time I felt a little gypped I'm not gonna lie I thought that that was a big omission I think if you go back and you look at this set list now of course maladjusted's the current album uh, you know Southpaw grammar in Vauxhall, I, Vauxhall and I are like right there also. But this set list, and of all the times I've ever seen Morrissey, apart from this tour, uh, I would say that he's he does a pretty good job, you know, sort of cherry-picking songs from different eras. Now, this one was very uh, era-specific. And like I said, the show uh, was only 13 songs, including the, uh, you know, the encore. And my friend just recently kind of gave me this idea uh, to go back and sort of make playlists on Spotify of the set of the shows I've been to uh, so you can kind of go back and listen to it. and it's all studio versions obviously but uh, so something I've been doing is going back and making uh, playlists on Spotify uh, of some of the shows I've been to uh, and I made a playlist for this one on Spotify and the playlist again it's all the studio versions and there's no banter or anything like that, obviously, which you get at a Morrissey show. Uh, but the playlist is only 55 minutes long. And so I do remember thinking that the show was uh, fairly abbreviated. And having, at the time, I didn't really know this, you know, but looking back on it now, having seen Morrissey a dozen times and having seen him uh, play much better shows than this one, much more interesting shows in terms of uh, the set list, uh, I would also make the 
observation that he wasn't necessarily in the greatest mood that night. You know, I think I've mentioned before that I think the my weakest show I've ever been to, personally speaking, was in 2014 uh, when I went to go see the World Peace Tour, uh, which, you know, I liked. I, I like seeing Morrissey every time, even this show, which, looking back on it, is probably my second least favorite of the 12 that I've seen in my life. Like I said, because, you know, the the length of the show just wasn't very satisfying and, you know, the set list was very narrow. Uh, and yeah, he, looking back on it, it didn't seem like he was necessarily in his best spirits. Now, for a long time, there was a conspiracy going around. And this was probably just people who lived in the Bay Area. I don't think this is something that, you know, carried over nationally or globally. But there was a, a lot of people in the Bay Area used to have this conspiracy that Morrissey hated San Francisco and that he was always in a bad mood uh, playing in San Francisco. Now, I don't think that's necessarily the case. It might have been the case back in the mid-90s. It's not the case now. I've seen him play shows uh, in the Bay Area that were uh, pretty snug. Uh, and this one, you know, like I said, this show wasn't terrible. I left very excited having seen him and still really at the time being in love with the album uh, Maladjusted. But looking back on it now, you know, you look at the set list and you're like, man, it's just very narrow and didn't play uh, very long. My friend and I remember, you know, we drove back out to the Bay Area and my friend actually spent the night at my house this night after the show. And I remember we were talking about it. And that was the thing we kept kind of coming back to was, man, that show was really short. It was probably at the time, it was probably uh, one of the shortest shows uh, I've ever been to. Uh, but I don't know if you... Uh, what's your experience the first time you saw Morrissey was? Uh, feel free to leave it in the comments if you are so interested. I do appreciate you indulging me today and allowing me to take this trip uh, down memory lane to my first show at the Warfield on October 8th, 1997. Uh, like I said, if you haven't been to the Warfield in San Francisco, I'd highly recommend it. If you haven't been to San Francisco, I highly recommend that too, son. Uh, anyway, man, thank you so much for checking out this video. This is Archaic Records. My name is Jamie, coming at you from Nashville, Tennessee. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check back every week for Morrissey Monday, a weekly celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths, as well as other record content and album reviews throughout the week. And until next time, my friends, I'll talk to you then.